In these times, when we look for hope, we need to remember to praise God for what has gone before. So in this song, we're going to do that. Let us sing praises rise. Okay. to worship and welcome to this new week in the month of October it is a wonderful way to start your week by being here so thank you for being here in person and online if you happen to be a guest this morning a special welcome to you and I invite for you to fill out the yellow guest card in the seat back in front of you if you fill that out and return it to the welcome window across the way, there's a gift waiting for you in exchange for that card and a chance to get to know you a little bit more fully. All are welcome to participate in every aspect of the service, including communion. And there's communion every worship service. So you're welcome to come up, receive an empty cup if you prefer wine, a filled cup if you prefer grape juice, and then the gluten-free bread, go back by the side aisles to your seat to conclude the rest of the service. Following the service, there is fellowship time in Luther Hall, and I'm told that today is especially uh, filled with goodies. So someone had a party over the weekend, and a lot of the food was brought here for you to enjoy. So please, go and eat it up. Um, there's also prayer after worship at the choir chairs if you would like to come up and receive some prayer individually from Sal. Um, coming, looking forward, we have the fall festival on the 4th of November, and that's for all who would like to come at 530. 
there will be meat provided by the fellowship team. And so because of that, we would like to know if you're coming. And there's a sign-up sheet at the information desk for you to indicate you're coming and what side you are bringing. So please do sign up if you plan to come to the Fall Fest. Um, the last day to sign up is next Sunday. Um, beginning in November, between services, there's an opportunity for you to listen to uh, Paul and engage in conversation with others in a class called Worship Matters. That'll be at 9 o'clock each Sunday in November, and I invite you to make that part of your Sunday morning. And then we have an announcement from a member of the evangelism team, the E-team, about an upcoming event. Good morning, everybody. Just Jill gave me about 30 seconds to talk to you real quick. Uh, we had a slide up. Sorry. Jill, give me a few seconds. If you noticed, there was a November 10th Save the Date notification on the slides up here. Save that date, if you would. We have an opportunity for everybody here to maybe invite some friends and neighbors, relatives, whomever, to attend a world-famous, our own Mike Tabor, or Tabor, is going to offer his world-famous uh, Red Rock, uh, what is it, Red Resort, Red Mountain Resort tour of downtown St. George, the art district, and also he's thrown in his own historical perspectives on St. George, so it's really a fun event. Mike has offered to give us that in terms of two options on Friday, November 10th, one from 10 to 12, the other from 1 to 3, and it is probably one of the most popular things the Red Mountain Resort does for tours. He's offered to do this for us as a congregation, so invite your friends, neighbors, whatever. It's limited to 20 per person because you're going to visit uh, galleries as well as have a chance to talk with artists. Mike himself is an artist, so I think you'll find it pretty interesting about what's going on in the scene around St. George, around the art district and stuff, as well as just historical facts and figures around St. George. So uh, plan on it and let us know. We'll have a sign-up sheet. We'll also do a crossover luncheon sometime after the 12, 12 noon session, before the 1 o'clock session, so 40 people can invo involve themselves in the luncheon together. Thank you, Joe. Is the, is the sign-up going to be up next Sunday? <coughs> next Sunday, at the info desk. Or just call the church. Okay. Um, then, um, the Holiday Bazaar is November, and there are still some needs for items and food. There's a sign up at the information desk for that, but if you're there at the information desk for any reason, pick up one of the Holiday Bazaar invites and take one of those home. It's just a little postcard you can pick up and take home on your way out. Uh, a reminder that this Saturday at 11 p.m. is the Chris Baudet Memorial Service, and that is here in this space. And then uh, lastly, New Promise is a church um, in St. George as a congregation, but we are part of a larger body called the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA. We have very little contact with the other churches uh, in this um, synod, this region. The closest one is in Vegas. And um, so our youth don't have a whole lot of opportunity to see the larger church at, in action. Every three years, the larger church puts on what is called a national youth gathering. 50 to 60,000 youth in one place. It becomes an opportunity for these young people to be in leadership, to be in service, to worship with one another, and of course to have a blast. So I want, uh, this year we're gonna go. We've never gone before, and so this is a very new experience. And so I'm going to give you a chance to take a look and see what it's all about. Testing one, two, three, here I go.
Now, who doesn't want to go to that? <laughs> yeah, that's going to be fun. We are going to start doing a little bit of fundraising, not as much as we did for Costa Rica, but we're going to be doing a little bit of fundraising to help us get to New Orleans in July. Yeah. <laughs> we are going to be offering you an opportunity to pre-order pies. Thanksgiving pies or Christmas pies, pumpkin or apple, and they're going to be homemade by the kids going. So I invite you to stop at the table after worship and sign up if that is something of interest to you. That's it for Parish Notes. I invite you to stand and rise, face the font as you are able. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us take a moment before God in humility confessing our sins. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We're afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond all compare. In Jesus, God is always making new, a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Praise God with prayer and singing. Praise God with all our siblings in Christ. Praise God with, in, with instruments, with instruments and voices. Praise God with all our siblings in Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you. 
Holy One of Israel. King David worked hard to return the Ark of the Covenant to Israel so that the people could honor you in your house of worship. Receive our praise in this house of worship as we rejoice in your presence. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from Mark chapter 11. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed behind were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. A reading from 2 Samuel. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be the shepherd of my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baali, Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God, and Ahio went in the front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. The word of the Lord. Please read responsively now from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise, Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise, Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipes. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can the kids who are here come on up? Let's spend some time up front. Nice. Question for y'all. How do you praise God? Give me an idea of how we can praise God. What's one way? Yeah. Go to church. Excellent way to praise God. What's another way to praise God? Sing. Excellent way to, to praise God. What are some other ways we can praise God? Huh? Pray. Absolutely. I think that prayer is a, a form of praise especially when you're offering it up and saying, thank you, God. What else? Can we play instruments? Yeah, we've got a lot of instruments in this place, and instruments alone can be a praise to God. Our voices can be a praise to God. Guess what? Our bodies can, too. We can praise God with our bodies, right? How do we praise God with our bodies? We dance. Stand up here, guys. Because in church, we don't normally get up and jive, do we? I mean, you don't see us doing a dance here in church. But 
Some of our church songs are worthy of dancing. So let's shout to the Lord and dance. <laughs> shout to the Lord, the earth and the Let's stand and have a prayer. God, you give us our bodies, our minds, our souls, our hearts, our speech. Everything is worthy of your praise. Help us to praise you every day, any way we can. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. By the way, that's the sending song. And you're going to be on your feet. That is the least Lutheran we have looked in a long time, I'll tell you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh. All right, we should pray. Gracious God, uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts um, uh, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. See, I'm, I'm, I've lost it. I've completely lost it. Thank you. Shout to the Lord. Okay. All right. Maybe we should start over here. Okay. So last week, we uh, heard the wonderful story of Ruth and uh, Ruth's covenant with Naomi, this wonderful commitment to cling to her and be uh, one of her people and one of her God, uh, worship her God. And, of course, we talked about last week the fact that Ruth is the great-great-grandmother of the most famous celebrated king in all of Israel. And it's to that king that we turn today. Now, most people know that David is the most important king in Israel. What people don't always understand is that David's path to becoming king was not really as simple as we often think it is, right? David was actually anointed king no less than three times. The first time was when he was just a boy. This is probably the story most of you heard in Sunday school, right? Uh, God directs Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and to anoint one of his sons. And so Samuel shows up and says to Jesse, one of your sons is to be king, so let me see them. And he parades them past Samuel. And each time Samuel says, nope. This isn't the one. Nope, this isn't the one. And they go on through all the sons, and Jesse finally says, well, that's the last one. The only other son I have is just a boy. He's out in the field with the sheep. And Samuel says, well, send for the boy. And of course, it turns out to be David, and he's anointed king just as a boy. That is the first anointing of David. But of course, this all happens while Saul is still king in Israel. And David, uh, for a time, serves under Saul as a, a soldier and then a leader of soldiers. But David increasingly grows in stature and reputation, and Saul becomes more and more suspicious and jealous of David and then outright tries to kill David, right? At this point, David becomes a leader of a militia, kind of works outside of the control of Saul, escaping Saul, who's chasing after him, but also fighting some of these battles to keep the enemies of Israel at bay. And there's this steady decline of Saul's rule and this steady rise in David's reputation. Until David's tribe, Judah, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, decides to anoint David king rejecting Saul. So this is the second time that David is anointed king, but it's again only uh, a king of that one tribe of Israel, not all of them. 
But eventually Saul does die. And uh, surprisingly, this doesn't result in David becoming king of all Israel because you see uh, Saul's tribe um, doesn't want to give up its central place in Israel, right? As the tribe from which the king comes. And also Saul's son, Ishbaal, has a claim to the throne. He thinks he should be the heir to the throne. So in comes this uh, very other important person. His name is Abner. Abner is the general of Saul's army, and he has a lot of power because he controls the military. Now, Abner can't be king because he's not an heir of the king, but he can kind of Uh, dictate who uh, he thinks should be king. And so he first says, well, Ishbaal should be king. But Ishbaal and Abner have a falling out over a girl, right? I know, it's, it's messy. This would be great soap opera, wouldn't it? And so uh, Abner throws his weight behind David. And he arranges to meet with David to talk about the details of how they will do this exchange of power to make sure that David can be king. But it gets messier because Joab, who is David's general, doesn't like Abner because Abner killed his brother. And so he secretly kills Abner without David knowing, and all of their plans go down the tubes. Meanwhile... Two other captains in Saul's army decide they will take matters into their own hands and they, they want to win favor with David and so they kill Ishbaal, the heir, and they present him to David and say, aha, we have cleared the way for you to take the throne. Thinking David is going to reward them, David has them killed because they killed an innocent man. This is all backstory to how David becomes king. And if that sounds messy, it's because it's totally messy. It's, it's a mess, right? And kind of unnecessary, right? With no more heirs to Saul's throne, and with potential threats from other nations, the northern tribes decide to turn to David and to anoint David as their king as well. This is the third and final time that David is anointed king. But in that arrangement, when the tribes come down, they acknowledge three things. First, they acknowledge that they are all related, right? We are your flesh and bone. Secondly, they acknowledge that um, David had really always been the one who provided leadership in Israel. Even when Saul was king, they say, it was you that led Israel out and brought it back in. And third, they acknowledge that David is God's choice to lead Israel. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be the shepherd of my people, you who shall be ruler over Israel. Isn't that interesting? Because all of those things have been true for a long time, right? They've always been part of the same people of Israel, related. And even when Saul was alive, everyone recognized that it was David who was really the one who was protecting and serving Israel best. And finally, uh, they point out that they have known for a long time that God had anointed David as a boy. So why did it take seven and a half years of civil war, rivalry, bloodshed, tragedy for them to reconcile and make David David king? Well, probably because they didn't quite trust each other, right? The northern tribes didn't trust David, this southern guy, to really understand the needs of the tribes in the north to be sympathetic to the challenges of their community and their circumstances, right? But another important reason is that they didn't trust God. They didn't trust God 
to be able to work through someone of a different tribe with different values, different notions, different ideals, even if they were of the same flesh and bone. The fact that they didn't trust God is obvious when they admit knowing that God had chosen David to be king of Israel and yet resisted it and fought against it for seven and a half years. But it's also clear that they didn't trust God to be working still through the promises that God had made to Israel in the past. The covenants, we've talked about two important covenants Um, in this year's narrative lectionary. One is the covenant with Abraham. And in that covenant, God promised that God would bless the descendants of Abraham and that God would bless other nations through Abraham's descendants. But they didn't trust that. They didn't trust that God could work in anyone other than them, right? And in not trusting it, they undermine the possibility of that promise for them and for anyone other than them. Likewise, they didn't trust God's covenant at Sinai. We heard about that one just two weeks ago. In that covenant, God lays out before Israel what it means to love God, and it includes loving and trusting one another. Loving and trusting one another is part of what it means to love and trust God. I can't help but wonder if this is also partly what we suffer from in our own political context. Many of us probably remember a time when the political parties in this country worked well together Right? They had different principles, but found ways to compromise. They trusted one another, even when they didn't agree with one another. But we have slowly moved apart in this country, in our uh, politics. And yes, clearly there's a distrust of the parties. What right? Each party has a distrust for the other. But also, there is a lack of trust in God here, too. We don't trust God to be able to work through people who don't think the way we do, or believe the way we do, or act the way we do, or see the world in the same way we do. Maybe this is where we need to learn from David. David, in this moment, this third uh, anointing, recognizes this lack of trust, and he does three things to address it. First of all, he makes a covenant, a relational commitment to all of Israel as their king. Secondly, he moves the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, which was a city that no, uh, was not possessed by any of the tribes of Israel till that point. So it's a neutral place to serve as a capital for all of Israel. And finally, David moves the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, and the remembrance of the covenant with, at Sinai to the capital, right? And he does this in a very public procession, right? Dancing wildly, kind of like uh, we just saw in the front of the church here a minute ago. He does it so uh, Uh, energetically that he embarrasses his wife. Can you imagine a husband embarrassing his wife by dancing? Um, But I think this last thing that David does is the most important. By moving the Ark of the Covenant into the new capital, David provides them with a constant reminder of this covenant. A reminder that loving God and trusting God means loving and trusting those whom God has chosen, right? And this Ark of the Covenant becomes a a constant reminder of God's presence with them, a reminder that God is with them. And that's no small thing. 
In fact, there's a kind of refrain throughout the Bible, God is with us, right? When Moses didn't want to uh, accept this call to deliver the people from Israel, God said, don't worry, I'll be with you. When Jeremiah said, I'm too young to be a prophet of the Lord, God said, don't worry, I will be with you. When Isaiah foretells the birth of a child, he proclaims that the child's name will be Emmanuel. God is with us. And the very last words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel are, remember I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We can trust God to be with us and to work in us, even in our differences. I would suggest that trusting one another really begins with trusting God. Trusting that God is not just working through one political ideal or perspective or the other, but the relationship that exists between the two, holding them together, finding ways to move forward. God works through our differences, the relationships among those of different opinions and ideas and values. Now, that might sound optimistic, but it is biblical. And it is, in fact, the vision of the founding fathers of this country who imagined when they designed, it's what they imagined when they designed a, a, a representative form of government where people of different ideals and values work together to make decisions for the whole country, right? Only by trusting God can we trust one another and live up to our own pledge to be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. I invite you to profess our faith in the words, words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. 
he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence that God's justice is sure, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God with us. With King David, we rejoice in song and dance at the knowledge of your presence in this place. Bless those who structure and lead us in worship, that we may feel meaningfully connected to you and our faith community. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. All creation praises you with waving branches, pounding surf, claps of thunder, and joyful cries of countless animals. Make us to rejoice in your creation, just as creation rejoices in you. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. Even David, the most beloved king of Israel, was a deeply flawed man. Give all leaders the humility to recognize their limitations and commit themselves to putting the needs of others ahead of their own. God of justice, mercy, hear our prayer. You promised to turn our mourning into dancing. Hold all who suffer illness or grief that they might know your presence and be comforted. We also pray for those listed in promising news who have asked for prayer. Prayers from the congregation are now invited, either aloud or from your hearts. God of justice, mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for all who fill our lives and our world with song. Inspire musicians throughout the world to keep us singing and dancing our love for you, God of justice. You promise peace, and yet such peace remains unfulfilled. We pray for the efforts of all who work for peace and who guard the lives of the, and well-being of others. Specifically, we pray for all the armed forces of this country, God of justice. With gratitude, we remember all whose leadership in our faith communities kept them strong through the years. Help us to walk in their footsteps until we join them in the dance of eternity. God of justice. Merciful God, we turn all these things over to your tender care, trusting that you hear and answer all our prayers spoken and unspoken, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please share that sign of peace with those around you. Healthy giving to me is helping the ladies make left side for the church bazaar. Hi, I'm Sue Gilman Hasenwinkel, church council president. Healthy giving for me is donating blood. Hi there, my name is Dana Smith, and my example of healthy giving is uh, supporting the computers over at uh, and the network over at Switchpoint. I do that for both staff and clients. Hi, my name is Ollie, and an example of healthy giving is paying for my friends when they don't have money. Hi, my name is Rachel. Healthy giving is making someone stay with a beautiful bouquet. Hi, my name is Connie. 
healthy giving for me is listening to the Holy Spirit and when he tells you something is needed to do it because you find out later it's really what that person needed. Hi, my name is Sherry and an example for me of healthy giving is doing prayer shawls for the church. Hey everyone, and those were just some of the ways that we can engage in healthy giving. Certainly you have a healthy giving story, so after the service go out and record your own healthy giving story in the healthy giving corner so that we can share together in the ways that we give back to God who gave to us first. I invite you to stand as we bring forward our gifts and offerings. Uniting God, join together these and all the gifts of your faithful so that your healing and saving work 
might be done in our communities and throughout all creation. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And let us pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just as the Ark of the Covenant was assigned to the people of God's presence with them, so this holy meal proclaims that Jesus is here with us now, and strengthens us through the sharing of his body and blood, come and eat for all is prepared. I invite the congregation to this.
invite the congregation to stand as you are able. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your eyes. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that Go in peace. God is at work in you.